So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Vincent van Gogh's life has usually been studied through his paintings. Many people have learnt about Van Gogh through Irving Stone's famous novel, Lust for Life. But I must point out to you that that's a very highly fictionalized, romanticized version of his life. And it's also not very accurate in parts. I have studied his life through his letters. He was a very lonely person. He was only really close to his younger brother, Theo, who supported him financially throughout his life. And often at night, when he finished his painting, he would sit down and write a very long letter, sometimes 20 to 30 pages, to his brother Theo, in which he would pour his heart out. And as Vikram said, there are 953 letters which were discovered by Johanna Bonga, that is Theo's wife, after Theo died. And she released these to the public. And these letters are very detailed. They often have detailed illustrations of, and sketches of what he was thinking of and what he wanted to write. Vincent was proficient in Dutch, French, and English. Most of his letters are in either Dutch or French, but translations are available in English, which I studied. Now, these letters provide the real information on Vincent van Gogh. So, he was born in 1853 in Zundert in Holland. His father was a Protestant preacher. He had two brothers and three sisters. He was a loner as a child, he loved nature, he didn't mix easily, and he often bunked from school and went for a walk in the woods. Vincent's uncles owned one of the largest art dealerships in Europe with offices in all the major cities. It's a company called Goupil and C, Goupil and Company. And when he was 16, his uncle got him a job as a trainee in their company. When he was 19, Vincent had his first rejection from a young lady, who was Caroline Hannebeek. And he was very serious about her, but she went and married somebody else. And he keeps writing about her for about six months thereafter. This is significant, and I'll tell you why later. Four years later, in June 1873, he was transferred to their London office, and in London, he stayed as a paying guest with the lawyer family and became very infatuated with their daughter, Eugenie, and fell in love with her and proposed to her. And of course, Eugenie turned him down, and that was the second time that he was unsuccessful in love. Vincent had a really good eye for art, but he was really a socialist at heart. And he did not enjoy any of the commercial aspects of the job. So if he got a rich client who didn't really understand a painting, Vincent was very brief with him and sort of bundled him out of the office quickly. So Goupil were not happy with this at all. And so they transferred him to their Paris office to try and give him a second chance. But it was the same story again. And at the age of 23, in April 1875, they told him, sorry, we can't keep you. He next tried to be a schoolmaster in England and had two jobs, but neither of them worked out either. He then returned to Holland and decided that he wanted to serve God like his father. And his family helped him to go to Amsterdam to try and study for the exams, but that was too tough for him. And he didn't have the discipline, and so he dropped out of that too. He finally managed to get an assignment as a lay preacher on a probationary basis in an area of Belgium called the Borinage. This was a very depressed mining area where people were very poor and they died early. And an air of depression hung about the place. And Vincent writes in one of his letters, at first sight, everything around the mine has something dismal and deathly about it. The workers there are usually people emaciated and pale owing to fever and they look exhausted and haggard, 
whether beaten and prematurely old, the women generally sallow and withered, and all around the mine are poor miners' dwellings with a couple of dead trees, completely black from the smoke. So he flung himself into this work, full of dedication to this poor mining community, and he gave away his entire salary, all his belongings, his furniture, and slept on the floor, and was known as Christ of the coal mines. But this kind of unconventional behavior wasn't really appreciated by his superiors, and so they refused to extend his probationary period. And he was again without a job. He then experimented a little bit in his spare time with pencil and watercolor. And this is one of his very early sketches, which as you can see, where well, this is one of his very early pencil and watercolor sketches. And as you can see, it's very naive. It's not very developed. And Vincent used to make little notations on the sketch. So if I zoom into the sketch at this point, you will see here it says Verjun, which means orange uh, and green and yellow. And what he would obviously do is he didn't have the confidence to make the full painting, so he would sketch it, and then he would go back, and then he would paint it. So for a year, as I said, he hung around these villages of the Borinage, and not much is known then. And after a year, he recommenced his correspondence with Theo. Theo, meanwhile, had joined the same company, Goupil's, as uh, a very successful art dealer. And he saw Winston's wretched state and despair. He saw promise in his sketches, and he agreed to support Vincent and encouraged him to become a painter. So at 27, we find that Vincent takes a decision that he wants to become an artist. And after that date, all his letters are only about art. So he spends the next five years in Holland and Belgium. And this is known as his Dutch period, where he takes drawing lessons at the Academy of Fine Art in Brussels. And in 1881, he moves in with his parents in Eton, in Brabant. Now, once again, there were complications. A cousin of his, Kay Voss, who was recently divorced and had a small child, came to stay with his parents. And Vincent fell desperately in love with her and, of course, proposed to her again and got rejected. And he chased her mercilessly and said, I will melt the icicles in your heart. And he keeps repeating this phrase in his letters. And then she says the famous three words to him, no, nay, never. So there's a story that Vincent goes to her house. And when she hears that he's come, she runs up and hides in a bedroom. And the father comes down and tells Vincent that she's not here. And there's a candle burning there. And Vincent goes and dramatically puts his hand above the candle and says, I will not move it until Kay comes down. And then the father, of course, sensibly blows the candle out and gently shoes him out. But that gives us an insight into Vincent's character. He's an extremist. He pursues everything relentlessly. And he goes on talking in his letters about how much he loved Kay and how nobody would understand the purity of his love. Vincent felt very suffocated living at home because his, you know, his father was a preacher. He said, you must go to church on Sunday. Vincent said, nonsense. And so he had a row with his parents. And he left on Christmas Day, 1881. He went to The Hague and he started painting lessons from a cousin of the family called Anton Mauve, who was very well known and was a celebrated artist uh, in his own right. And he pointed out to Vincent that he needed to master drawing. So Vincent devised his own program of study to try and master these basic techniques. He didn't have natural talent. He had to work really hard and struggle to try and grasp it. And he writes these very frustrated letters to Theo and says, my hand does not follow my brain. He studies other artists, and slowly he becomes better. And this is one of his early sketches. And he's starting to get proportion and, and, and you know, a, a, a good sketch. Now, all his life, Vincent was attracted to the destitute and the suffering. And in July 1882, after setting up a studio in The Hague, he met an abandoned prostitute 
called Klasina Hurnik. Her nickname was Sain and she had a five year old. And he felt very sorry for her. So he took her in and she stayed on. And then she started modeling for him because he didn't have enough money to hire models. And then she became his lover. And eventually he wanted to marry her. And his family found out and they were really upset and said, you know, what the hell are you doing? Vincent opposed their conventional views. And I like this line he wrote in one letter. He said, well, gentlemen, I'll tell you, you who set great store by manners and culture, and rightly so, provided it's the real thing. What is more cultured, more sensitive, more manly, to forsake a woman or to take on a forsaken one? He had a very difficult relationship with Sain because her mother kept trying to pull her back into prostitution because she wanted the money. And eventually Sain slipped back into her old ways and Theo persuaded Vincent to give her up. So he did that with great sadness and on breaking up he was depressed and lonely and he wrote to Theo, I don't really have any friends except for you and when I am alone and ill you are always in my thoughts. Now, at that time, many French painters had taken up the painting of peasants and farm workers. And they lived in a place called Barbizon, near Paris. And there were people like Francois Millet, Millet in English, Jules Breton, Daubigny, and these were Vincent's models. And they all felt that peasants were very pure. They lived close to nature. Their lives were cleaner to those living in the civilized cities. And they painted life in the countryside, paying homage to this so-called honest and humble existence in the face of encroaching industrialization and urbanization. And these were the kind of paintings that they made. Gleaners was the name given to those people who were allowed to come to the fields to pick up the remains of what was left after the main cutting of the harvest had been done. Vincent found great dignity and beauty in the faces of peasants. He said, a peasant girl is more beautiful than a lady to my mind in a dusty and patched skirt and jacket, which have acquired the most delicate nuances from weather, wind and sand. But if she puts on a lady's costume, then the genuineness is lost. In September 1883, he started his own peasant paintings. And one of the early ones is two women on a heath. I want you to note the dark colors. Vincent really wanted to live on his own. He didn't want to live with his parents, but he wasn't able to survive on his own. So he returned home intermittently. And in December 1883, he went back and lived with his parents in a town called Noonan in Holland. Of course, in a matter of time, he fell out with them. There was acrimony about the cave was episode. He felt they hadn't supported him when he wanted to marry Sane. And he left, rented a studio in Noonan, and started traveling around this rural area that he really loved. And in early 1884, he suggested to Theo that he would give him his pictures in exchange for money, 50 francs, three times in a month. Now, Theo kept his dignity with this arrangement, although they both knew in their hearts that the, that the pictures were not really selling. And Theo also pointed out to him that these dark paintings were not selling because now there was a new trend starting called Impressionism, in which people were using colors. In the summer of 1884, he met Margot Bergman, who lived next door. And Vincent's mother fractured her leg whilst getting off a train. And she used to run sewing classes, so Margot came and ran these classes for her. Vincent, of course, met her in the house because he was staying there fell madly in love, <laughs> proposed to her. But this time, Margot also cared deeply for him. However, Margot's parents said nothing doing. And Margot was so upset, she went and took strychnine poison and almost died. And then she was sent away. So yet one more failed relationship in Vincent's life. So Vincent really wanted to be a peasant painter, but a different kind of peasant painter. And in April 1885, he made his first large composition, The Potato Eaters. He spent an entire winter 
and made 40 compositions of heads and hands before making this final painting. Now, you notice there are a lot of dark, gray, monochromatic colors. The play of light and dark is very significant here. And his peasants look very tired after working very hard, which Vincent did too. And he loved this honesty about them and wanted to paint them as they were. And he didn't want the artificiality of city life. And he wrote to Theo in one letter, I've tried to bring out the idea that these people eating potatoes by the light of their lamp have dug the earth with the self-same hands they are now putting into the dish. And it thus suggests manual labor and a meal honestly earned. I would be wrong, I think, to give a peasant picture a certain conventional smoothness. A peasant picture should smell of bacon, smoke and potato steam, and it must not become perfumed. Now he thought he made a great painting, but Theo was not so impressed. And his artist friend, Anton von Rappart, wrote to him, it's a caricature showing a woman with a dice for a nose. The other woman pouring tea looks artificial and contrived. I mean, you surely couldn't have meant this as a serious painting. Vincent was really upset, but he realized wisely that he still had a lot to learn. So he decided to get some lessons and get some ideas. And he studied at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts at Antwerp, painting portraits and studying the human body and so on, and doing all the classical stuff. But he fought with all his professors and left very quickly. Now, we need to understand the Protestant ethic. The Protestant ethic was very strong in Van Gogh because his parents were religious. And the Protestant ethic said that you had to work hard and be worthy of God and you must not seek reward or fame. And it was up to God whether he decided to reward you. So it is this, if you understand, that made Vincent such an obsessed and driving person who focused on painting to the exclusion of everything else and even his health, which ran down. And so he kept falling ill repeatedly. Now, in February 1886, Vincent, having heard so much about these Impressionists, decided to go to Paris. And that was where his brother lived. So without giving any notice, he just landed up one day and moved in with him. His brother lived in Montmartre, which was the bohemian location for all would-be artists. And it was the center of artistic freedom. There was a multitude of colorful bars, burlesque theaters, girly shows, bohemian cafes. But Vincent realized that to progress, he needed more contact with art and with artists. And he made friends with artists like Emile Bernard and Toulouse Lautrec, who were challenging the existing norms and exhibiting their art in cafes in Montmartre. And they introduced him to the hedonistic life of Montmartre, where they all went, spent late nights, drank copious amounts of absinthe, which was their favorite drink. Most paintings in those days, done by the old masters and major European artists, were done in dark colors, shades of gray and brown. The Impressionists wanted to paint life as it is, and they loved color. And there were Impressionist painters like Monet, Degas, Toulouse-Lautrec, Paul Gauguin, Cezanne, Surat. Surat pioneered a technique called pointillism, where you paint with little dots and make the picture up with these dots. They were all penniless, they were all broke, and they all believed that economic deprivation and suffering was part of being an artist. So after seeing this Paris avant-garde, Vincent realized that his work was very old-fashioned. He started experimenting with color. He was very keen to do something daring and new. And in March 1886, he made Boulevard the Clichy. Then he followed this up with Garden in Montmartre. Now this painting is a very important step in his development because he moved from dark, somber paintings to bright color. The change was rapid, almost as if somebody had opened the blind and let the light flood into the room. And he moved from the points and pointillism of Surat to streaks and dashes, which slowly started becoming his evolving style. And you see this also 
in the self-portrait that he made of himself with a grey hat. When he was there, he met Agostina Segatori. Ladies, please note the hairstyles in Paris at that time. She had a bar called La Tambourine and he had a brief affair with her and painted her, but the relationship again did not last. After this, he had no further serious relationships and he only made visits to the brothel. He wrote to his sister Wilhelmine in October 1887. He said, for my part, I still continually have the most impossible love affairs from which as a rule I emerge only with shame and disgrace. He found Paris very exhausting, too much happening, too much visual noise, too cold, and he didn't keep well. And he longed for a place that was peaceful and warm. Now, we need to pause here and understand the huge influence that Japan had on the life of Van Gogh and on his art. Japan had been in isolation for many years and it was opening to the world in 1884. And in the late 19th century, there was a craze in Paris, a Japan fever for all things Japanese, in arts, crafts, clothes, everything. Japanese painters popularized their paintings from prints made from woodcuts. The, the painting would be kind of etched onto wood and cut, and then you could stamp out lots of prints, a bit like batik in India, but it meant that the artist could popularize his work by circulating hundreds of, of these prints, and people could get an idea of that. And this is the kind of, the kind of prints which those artists made, very colorful. This is by a very well-known artist at that time called Hiroshige. Van Gogh found them to be utterly fresh, brightly colored. And these prints offered a different approach to composition and perspective. Vincent was searching for a modern, more decorative style. And these Japanese prints provided this with flat areas of color. So he studied Japanese artists and he painted copies of prints of theirs. He copied them to master the style. And flowering plum tree is a very well-known one. Then there was courtesan, which he also did which was you know, made by Japanese, the original was made by Japanese called Aisen. So these early experiments sent his art in a new direction. So what did Van Gogh learn from these Japanese prints? He started seeing, as he said himself, with a Japanese eye, bright flat areas of color, bold contour lines, leaving out the horizon. You find in his paintings, he starts cutting out the horizon and zooming in on details of nature. Four things I'd like you to bear in mind as I walk you through his paintings later. He never visited Japan, but he developed his own fantasy about Japan. He saw Japanese artists as humble artisans, living and working together in a monastery, exchanging paintings, cooperating and assisting each other. And he believed that the art of the future should be colorful. And for him, Japan pointed the way. So he started looking for his own Japan in Europe, and he felt that he could find this in the south of France. He saw that region as a paradise, with plenty of sun, beautiful colors, bright light, and compared to the dark gray of northern Europe. And he therefore decided to move to Arle in southern France in February 1888. And this region, completely exceeded his expectations. It was bright and sunny and hot with the mistral blowing through it. And he felt as if he was in Japan. And he keeps writing in his letters, I am in Japan. I mean, I, he even says to his sister, I know I'm not in Japan, but I like to think I'm in Japan. And the natural beauty around him offered him plenty of inspiration. And we now start entering into the period that really defines him. When he arrived in Arla in February 1888, it was cold, it was snowy, but pretty soon spring came. And full of enthusiasm, he started a series of studies of trees in blossom. And he wrote to Theo that mental exhaustion of mine is disappearing. I no longer feel so much need for diversion. I am less plagued by passions and I'm able to work more calmly. 
Many of you may recognize the White Orchard, which is one of his famous paintings. And he produced 14 paintings of fruit trees in blossom in a month. He wrote to Theo, such subjects cheer people up. He was filled with new energy and heightened ambitions. And he painted one sun-drenched landscape after another in an extraordinary period of creativity. He used to throw himself into his work, leave his house at four in the morning, go with his backpack into the field, skip lunch, come back late at night, talk to no one. All the locals thought he was a real nut. And his work was a frenzy of exhaustion, draining his emotional energy and leaving him physically broken and fragile. And he wrote, I feel such a creative force in me. I am convinced that there will be a time when I will make something good every day on a regular basis. After his exposure to the impressionist painters in Paris, color occupied Van Gogh throughout his life, because he was convinced color was the future. And he had an instinctive understanding of culture, uh, of color, and also read a lot about it. And he kept a box with these balls of colored yarn, which he kept using each time before he made a painting to check if the colors were complementary or not. And he wrote, instead of trying to render exactly what I have before my eyes, I use color to express myself forcefully. And finally, his own distinctive style started emerging with beautiful colors and broad brush strokes. And in March 1888, he painted one of his most loved paintings, the Langua Bridge, which shows women washing clothes. And in June 88, he followed this up with 10 paintings and five sketches known as the Harvest series, the most famous of which was Harvest at La Crau. Now this reflects his experiments with flat areas of color, bold outlines, which I talked earlier. You can see this in the spiky cut corn field contrasted against the flat areas of standing corn. And you can almost feel the dryness and the heat in this painting. His period of learning, searching, experimenting was now over. He was now a confident painter in his own right. He considered this one of his best paintings and he wrote to his brother in very modern language, this canvas absolutely kills all the rest. In June 88, he painted Sunset, wheat field near Arle. And we can see across a broad expanse of restless wheat, the town's dark silhouetted outline lit by a giant moon, giving the painting a mysterious, slightly haunting air. In June 88, he painted the sower. He had a big thing about sowing and reaping because he felt it represented the cycle of life and death. And he painted maybe 20 such sower compositions. And I'll show another one later. Then in June 88, he visited the fishing village of La Sainte Marie de Lama and painted seascapes and also fishing boats at uh, La Sainte Marie de Lama. Vincent was constantly anxious about his finances. And in every letter, he mentions money. The letters start with, you know, thank you, Theo. I've received your last, uh, you know, um, note or check. And, you know, I need some more to buy paints and canvases and things like that. And it is greatly to Theo's credit. I think Theo is a real hero of the Vincent van Gogh story because he supported him right throughout and was also a friend, philosopher, and guide. Now, this financial anxiety meant that Vincent was constantly stressed and he fell sick very often. But from all his letters, it clearly emerges that he worked in a very systematic manner. Every drawing and painting was a conscious attempt to improve. And this is completely contrary to the prevalent view that he was an impulsive and emotional painter and he went crazy and painted and he was crazy. Vincent van Gogh never painted when he was unwell. He only painted when he was okay. 
And I think the person to blame for that sort of theory is Irving Stone, who sort of popularized it in that book, and then Hollywood picked it up and you know had this picture of this guy. He also wanted to be a serious painter of portraits. He got people in Arla to pose for him. And the local postman, Joseph Roulon, became a great friend of his. Vincent painted his whole family. There are lots of very famous paintings, but I'm going to show you just one because, you know, time is short. Now, Vincent had this idea of wanting to form a commune of artists in the South. And he wanted to do this so that it would be similar to what the Japanese did. And so he asked Theo for an increase in his allowance to 200 francs per month. And in May 1888, he rented the Yellow House for 15 francs per month. And in September 1888, he painted this. And this was the sanctuary that he longed for. He wrote, my house here is painted outside in the yellow of fresh butter with garish green shutters. Inside, I can live and breathe and think and paint. In the autumn of 1888, he portrayed himself as a bonze, a Japanese monk. And you see this painting with shaven head and slightly slanting eyes. And he sent this to his good friend Gauguin. In September 1888, he painted one of my favorites, The Night Cafe. And he wrote, I've tried to express the terrible passions of humanity by means of red and green. The room is blood red and dark yellow with a green billiard table in the middle. There are four lemon yellow lamps with a glow of orange and green. And the same month, he painted his famous cafe terrace at night and wrote, it often seems to me that the night is even more richly alive and colored than the day, colored in the most intense violets, blues, and greens. And this was the first painting in which he experimented with a starry background. Then he followed this with his starry night over the Rhone. The Rhone River was only two minutes from his house. So he loved painting that. And in October 1888, he painted his famous bedroom in the Yellow House. And this is one of the paintings he did to decorate the rooms in which he felt Gauguin would stay when he came. I'll talk about this later. And he takes liberties. The dimensions are exaggerated. The bed is very, head of the bed is very large. The chair is very small. But these are paintings which are very uh, popular throughout the world. In his letters, he agonizes constantly, like almost, I was trying to calculate once in every seven letters about his paintings not selling. He says, I can do nothing if my paintings don't sell. And ladies and gentlemen, the sensitivity with which this man says this and the pain that he must be feeling comes through so strongly that when you read the letters, truly, it's all you can do from not letting your eyes go moist. He says, the day will come when people will see that these paintings are worth more than the cost of the paint and my subsistence. Very meager, in fact, that we put in them. He was greatly in awe of Paul Gauguin, and he invited him to this yellow house to be head of this group of artists that he wanted to gather together. And after much persuasion, Gauguin came in October 88, 1888. And Vincent was thrilled, and he painted five versions of this very famous painting, Sunflowers. He loved nature. Sunflowers were his favorite flower. And here he uses yellow in so many different ways. Critics of the day recognized that sunflowers were something completely new and quite unique. In autumn of 1888, he made another variation of the sower, where he uses colors to express emotion and passion. The bright yellow sun looks like a halo, turning the sower into a saint. Now for Vincent and Gauguin, living together was great in the beginning. They sat together, they chatted, they went and painted together. Then the initial joy and excitement of working together was replaced by constant bickering. Gauguin believed in painting from the imagination. 
Whereas Vincent believed in painting realistically what he saw in front of him, a field, a flower. And they argued a lot. And Vincent wrote, our debates are exceedingly electric. And sometimes when we finish, our minds are as drained as an electric battery after discharge. With frosty and cold weather, the two were stuck in the house every evening and they got on each other's nerves. Arguments got very heated and strained and Gogai finally felt this was not working out and he said, I want to go back to Paris. Vincent was very upset about this. His mood started changing rapidly. One moment he was lucid and the next he was very agitated. And on the 23rd of December, Vincent suffered an acute mental breakdown and cut off his left ear. Now the popular story is that he did so on a prostitute's request and he gave her the ear. Gauguin later reported that when he was stepping out of the house the previous evening, Vincent approached him with a crazy look in his eye and a razor in his hand. And Gauguin said, I stared back in his eye and Gauguin was a big guy with a very powerful personality. And he said, Vincent backed off. And then he said he felt so unsettled that he didn't stay there that night. He went and stayed in a hotel. And when he came back next morning, there was all this hangama. And you know, the, 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 the police were there. And the, the entire uh, uh, house, yellow house, was filled with people. And Gauguin was promptly arrested because he was the last guy to be with Vincent. Then he explained and he was let off. And then, strangely, he leaves for Paris without meeting Vincent. And he is reported to have said, if Vincent asks for me, tell him I have left for Paris. The sight of me could be fatal to him. Now why would he say this? There are a lot of conflicting theories about what happened. There's an English woman named Bernadette Murphy, who lived in Provence recently, and she did a lot of research into this ear episode of Van Gogh. And she published her findings two years ago, in 2016. Did Gauguin, who was an expert swordsman, get into a fight and cut off his ear? I read the doctor's report by Dr. Felix Ray, and it describes zigzag cuts on the ear, which would be quite consistent with a rapier. Gauguin's reports to the police and in his autobiography differ hugely. And there was no mention of the razor that Vincent is supposed to have accosted him within the park. Gauguin later wrote to Vincent, and there's a letter I read, in which he says, please send me my dueling gloves and some other gear, but makes no mention of the rapier. Also, we need to ask, why would Vincent keep quiet about it? Was it because he was so desperate for Gauguin not to go away and didn't want to offend him? Was it, as some say, because they had an affair and he did not want to talk about it, make it public. So Bernadette Murphy went through the town's registers and did some incredible research. The French records are very good, all the registers were there and she checked and she found out, she traced the family of that prostitute, Gabriel. And she found out that Gabriel actually was from a respectable family. And she met her great-grandchildren who were very upset that they said this, this, this story about our great-grandmother being a prostitute is rubbish. And apparently, uh, to cut it short, it was established that Gabriel had been bitten by a dog in her arm and she had to have some very expensive treatment. And to pay for this, she went and worked in this brothel as a maid, washing glasses and changing sheets. It was called the House of Tolerance Number 1. And Vincent, who was a frequent visitor, saw her there. And Murphy's theory is that on the night of the incident, Vincent probably met her outside the brothel. Remember, he was very religious. And in his heightened state, with his breakdown, he gave the girl a part of his own healthy body to replace her damaged flesh. And the words he spoke that night were rather like Christ at the Last Supper. This is my body. Take this in memory of me. Now, you can, you can follow the theory or not. There's another theory by the British art historian Martin Bailey, and I quite enjoyed reading his papers. He says on the day Vincent cut his ear, he got a letter from Theo informing him of his engagement with Johanna Bonga, which made Vincent really upset. 
And it's interesting to note that shortly after that incident, Vincent painted a still life with onions, showing a letter with a postmark. And if you peer closely, the date of that postmark is actually that date. So my view is that the ear cutting episode was probably a combination of many things. Vincent's emotional instability, no question about that his being upset that Paul Gauguin was going away, and maybe his insecurity over Theo's engagement. Anyway, Vincent was hospitalized. Whilst he was in the hospital, he made some reed pens from local reeds and made some amazing sketches. You see a lot of detail here. Gauguin's departure was very disheartening for Vincent because it destroyed his hope for a commune of artists living together. And on returning, Vincent was plagued with insomnia, nightmares, which left him drained physically and mentally. But he still painted his self-portrait with bandaged ear and pipe. And during his lucid periods, Vincent was completely rational. He wrote in one letter, as far as I can judge, I am not really mad. You will see that the canvases I have done in the meantime are untroubled and no worse than the others. So between December 88 and February 89, he had a number of these breakdowns. In one, he was, he was recorded trying to eat coal. In other, he complained he was being poisoned. Now, Arla was a small town and naturally there was a lot of gossip about this guy's aberrant behavior. So on 25th February 1889, 30 people in Arla sent a petition to the mayor that Vincent should be committed to an asylum. They complained he was unstable, he was a threat to society, he hugged women inappropriately, whatever that may mean. Vincent was devastated by this because he was trying to make Arla his home and this was a rejection by those people. And he wrote, you can imagine how much of a hammer blow, full in the chest, it was when I discovered that there were so many people here who were cowardly enough to band themselves together against one man and a sick one at that. And one of his friends, Marie Gnu, who had a, a small shop near his yellow house, she wrote, Vincent only really became ill afterwards because of the behavior of the stupid people here. So here again, the same Bernadette Murphy did some great research work. And she found out that there was a grocer named Damas Crevelon, who was living nearby. And he and his house agent named Bernard Soul, who was like a broker in Lajpat Nagar, wanted Vincent out of the yellow house because there was prime real estate. So they seized upon the ear episode to force Vincent out. And when she went into the antecedents of the people who had signed that petition, actually they were all either from Damas Crevelon's family or his servants or his relatives. So it was really actually only one family conspiring to push him out. But the yellow house was locked up and the petition went to the mayor who in his wisdom didn't sign it. So nothing happened. But he lost the yellow house. So Vincent was readmitted to the hospital on and off for one third of his time in Arles. One third of his time he was in the hospital. Yet, he kept on painting. And the extraordinary thing is, he recovered after each illness and made 187 paintings whilst he was in Arlo. He never painted when he was ill. He assessed his condition very soberly. He writes in one letter, what comforts me is that I am beginning to look upon madness as a disease like any other and to accept it as such. But by now, with frequent attacks, Vincent started losing confidence on whether he could live on his own. And on 8th May 1889, he volunteered that he wanted to go and stay at an asylum. And so his brother found him uh, a place at the private sanatorium of St. Paul de Mousseau in saint remy and saint remy was very close to Arla. So Vincent goes there, he found the asylum very peaceful, he starts painting irises 
as soon as he arrives there and this is another famous painting of his each petal is very unique fish featuring different shading shape and size and he made a painting of the hospital in his garden and in June 1889 Van Gogh painted what I think is his most famous painting starry night looking out through the bars of his window of his room in the asylum and he was able to depict turbulence in the sky it's almost a hallucinatory painting was it mirroring the agitation in his mind some say the seeds to his next breakdown can be found in this painting he used his imagination that church you see with a pointy steeple is not something which he saw because no church in France has pointy steeples that's a Dutch church and it included his favorite tree cypresses cypresses were actually associated with death in Western culture they were found really around graveyards but Vincent had a real fascination for them he found them tall stately like Egyptian obelisks Vincent was very unhappy you'll be surprised to know with this painting he felt the stars were too large and he writes in a letter that this has not come out right I'm not happy with it this painting is now in the Museum of Modern Art in New York it is valued at 300 million dollars 2,000 crores in fact most of Van Gogh's paintings are between 50 and 150 million dollars there's nothing which is below 10 million in fact there's I I did a search to try and see you know pretending to be a buyer but there are no paintings actually on the market whoever has it just keeps his Van Gogh to his chest Vincent then fell ill again had another breakdown in July 89 this time he tried to eat his paint and drink his turpentine and in September 1889 feeling really despondent he wrote to Theo I've abandoned any hope that it won't come back on the contrary we must face the fact that I will have an attack from time to time but here's the strange thing in spite of all this he made a hundred and forty two paintings while he was in Saint Remy by now Theo had become a father and he named his son Vincent and Vincent painted almond blossoms and dedicated it to his nephew he started to get recognition the art critic Albert Aurier wrote that here's an artist who seems to have potential and in February 1890 Theo sold one of Vincent's paintings for 400 francs this was the red vineyards and this was sold to Anna Bock collector and this was the only painting that he sold in his life other than a few small commissions he got from his uncle he also painted in San Rame wheat field with cypresses which has fantastic color and this was the view from his window towards the Alpil mountains he painted his last self-portrait a lot of people will recognize that and one of his powerful paintings which I like was his country road in Provence by night and he painted another of his uh, reaper paintings wheat field with a reaper from his bedroom window this is what he saw and he wrote I saw the image of death in it that humanity would be the wheat being reaped that in this death nothing is sad it takes place in broad daylight with a sun that floods everything in a light of fine gold so after a year at this asylum he felt better he felt stronger and he started missing home so he asked his brother can you find me a place near you and his brother contacted Pizarro the painter and Pizarro's wife said nothing doing I'm not having this ruffian in my house so that didn't work out and then they found a gentleman a doctor he was a homeopathic doctor but he had done a treatise in melancholia and his name was Dr. Gashe and he lived in a town called Auver sur Us which was near Paris and on 16th May 1890 Vincent went there he got on well with Dr. Gashe he stayed at an inn called the Auberge Ravu and he continued to be a loner and go out and make his paintings 
He painted Dr. Gachet. This painting sold two years ago for 600 crores, $83 million. Vincent produced many beautiful paintings when he was in Auvergne. I love his landscape at twilight, sort of puts the woods on fire. He says he's trying to create an evening effect with a sentiment of peace and majesty. He painted the church at Auvergne. Now, in a letter, a very sad letter that he writes to Theo, he says he feels his life had been wasted and that he had been a failure all his life. Yet, this was one of the most productive periods of his life. He made 80 paintings in 70 days. One could say that he worked continuously because he just didn't want to allow himself to think about his predicament because that depressed him. And of course, one of his very famous paintings, a wheat field with crows. It took me three months to persuade my wife to put this in the living room. And this is a powerful painting which conveys a sense of fear in the fields with a heavy, foreboding atmosphere, menacing crows, three paths leading all over the place, symptomatic of Vincent's confusion, where to go, and the main path in the middle suddenly coming to a halt. Many people thought that this was his kind of suicide note, but that is not true, because he painted many happy paintings after this. Now in Paris, Theo was having trouble with his new employers. Goupil and C had been sold to another company called Boussard and Valadon. And Theo was thinking of leaving and starting his own company. And Vincent, when he heard this, felt very, very insecure. So he rushed to Paris to meet Theo. They didn't have a very good meeting for some reason. The letters are not very clear. I can, there's something about Theo's son falling sick and about various art dealers coming in at critical moments when Vincent is trying to get reassurance from him and sort of breaking up his conversation. And Vincent then comes back, uh, you know, to, to, to Auvergne without a sort of clear answer in his mind. But he writes a very uh, poignant letter. In July 1890, he writes, it is no small matter when we are all made aware that our daily bread is at risk. No small matter when for different reasons we are also made aware of the precariousness of our existence. My life is under attack at its very root. My step is also unsteady. I fear that I was a danger to you living at your expense. Note that he used the word was, not is. Now that's a red flag. Vincent at that time was at a very low point. Illness, despair, an uncertain future, all weighing heavily on his mind. And in his despondency, he writes in one letter, as a painter, I will never amount to anything. I am absolutely sure of it. On the afternoon of 27th July, 1890, Vincent left his lodgings and disappeared. He staggered back to the hotel bleeding around 9 p.m. that night and confessed to having shot himself in the stomach with a revolver. The bullet traveled through his body and lodged in his left flank. So a local doctor, Dr. Mazeri, was called immediately and Dr. Gache, and they tried to help him and Vincent said, don't or I'll do it again. Vincent was in agony. Theo rushed down the next day and spent time with him Vincent was able to smoke his pipe and uh, talk to Theo. And at 1.30 a.m. on 29th July, Vincent van Gogh died in Theo's arms, explaining that his suicide had been deliberate. According to Theo, a letter that he wrote to his sister Lise, he says, when I was sitting with him and I told him that we would try to cure him, and we kept hoping that he would be spared this sort of despair, he said, the sadness will last forever. I know what he meant. So the funeral was fixed for 2.30 p.m. the next day, but at the last minute, the local priest refused him a service, saying that because he committed suicide, he, 
He could not have a funeral in this place. So his friends and fellow artists, there were eight of them who had come down from Paris, they placed his coffin on a central table in this inn, the Auberge Ravu, and they placed sunflowers, which he loved, on his coffin, and they placed his paintings around him, and many of his paintings were still wet, and then buried him in a cemetery in Auvergne. And Theo wrote, how empty it is everywhere. I miss him so. Everything reminds me of him. After his death, Theo worked very hard to popularize Vincent's works. But within six months, Theo, who was suffering from tertiary syphilis himself, which had no cure then, had a nervous breakdown, was committed to an asylum in Utrecht in Holland, and died at the age of 32. So on 14th April 1914, his widow, Johanna, had Theo's remains moved to Auvergne to be placed next to his brother Vincent, whom he adored. This was the last painting that Vincent did. He was painting this on the morning before he killed himself. And it is incomplete. Now, did Van Gogh commit suicide? In 2011, Stephen Nefe and Gregory White Smith wrote a book arguing that it was unlikely that he killed himself, but was accidentally killed. They show that the bullet entered Van Gogh's stomach at such an oblique angle that he would have had to have fired it with his outstretched toe. There were no powder burns on his hands. His paintings were quite upbeat before his death, so there was no reason that he should kill himself. How did he travel the one mile distance from the fields to the inn if he had shot himself? Why was his painting gear never found? Although the revolver was found four years later. Now Van Gogh was always troubled by a group of boys, rich boys, who came down from Paris to Auvergne during the summer. Auvergne was a kind of summer retreat. And they used to trouble Vincent and tease him and throw stones at him and say, you're a crazy guy. And their leader, René Secretin, had a gun. And he used to shoot crows with this. And Nefe and Smith say that he probably shot Vincent. And in 1956, Secretaire gave a guilt-ridden interview in which he confirmed tormenting, but not killing, Vincent. Could Van Gogh have seen the shooting as a favor because he was so unhappy and wanted a way out? Now the films Loving Vincent, which many of you may have seen, and the new film At Eternity's Gate, which was premiered at the Venice Film Festival 10 days ago and will be released worldwide in November, they both support this theory. The Van Gogh Institute investigated this over two years, but they eventually rejected it. I also reject it. I believe Vincent was very depressed, as he really and truly felt, when you read his letters, it comes through so strongly that he had been a failure. He had been a failure in earning a living, a failure with women, a failure in society, and his continuing illnesses made it worse. He felt he was a financial drain on his brother. And when Theo started talking of starting his own business, I think that was the final straw. Now, what was Vincent's illness? A lot of people want to know that. We cannot answer that precisely. There was a very strong family history of psychiatric problems through the maternal line with an epileptic epileptic aunt, and three siblings who ended up in the asylum. Doctors in those days called all emotional problems epilepsy. But experts today lean towards bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder, a form of epilepsy with alcohol as a contributory factor because he drank a lot. Appreciation of Van Gogh's work grew very rapidly after his death. He left behind 860 paintings, 1,200 drawings and sketches, and as you all know, he is recognized today as one of the most influential Western artists. On a personal note, after reading his letters, 
The overwhelming feeling left with me was that Vincent van Gogh's life was full of sadness. In his last letter to Theo, found in his blood-stained pocket the day he shot himself, he wrote, and to be honest, it is only through our pictures that we speak. As for my work, I risk my life for it. And my sanity is half shot away because of it. But what's to be done? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to say a few quick thank yous before I go and join Vikram. Big thanks to Vikram for coming and sharing it this evening. A big thanks to my family for putting up with my obsession with Van Gogh for all these years. A big thanks to Sumantra Nag who pushed me into making the speech. And of course a big thanks to Pramila Ghosh and the IIC for sponsoring this talk. Thank you. <laughs>